Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Monday, March 18th, 2024. the first story at the top of antiwar.com today the u.s is considering giving israel more military aid for leverage so recent media reports have said that there are discussions within the biden administration to condition military aid to israel if it invades rafa as a way to reduce civilian casualties so if you read those reports the assumption is that they're talking about the U.S. threatening to cut off military aid to Israel or reducing military aid, reducing the weapons supply to Israel. But according to a report from ABC News, the U.S. might do the opposite. So this report cited U.S. officials who said that the U.S. has not made a decision, not made a decision on leveraging military aid And it said that it's possible additional aid, not less, would be offered as incentive to reduce civilian casualties. So the idea that they might give Israel more weapons to reduce civilian casualties, I mean, it's completely absurd. Uh, I guess this shouldn't really be a surprise because as I've covered these reports a a little bit, there's just a few of them. That said, the U.S. Biden was considering conditioning aid if they invade Rafa. You know, I was very doubtful of them. And I mean, if this is what they're talking about, increasing the aid. Listen, we'll give you more weapons if you kill less civilians. At the same time, they're they're buying all of Israel's lies and propaganda. So it wouldn't really mean anything. Um, and so U.S. officials made these comments in response to a senior Israeli official complaining that U.S. weapon shipments were not coming fast enough. This Israeli official said that in the wake of October 7th, U.S. weapons were coming very fast, but that now they are finding it's very slow. So in response to that, U.S. officials denied that there was any intentional slowdown in weapon shipments to Israel. So essentially what, what they said here was, no, if any, we're actually considering giving them more. You know, you see these reports about us conditioning aid. We're not doing that. We're, we're actually considering giving them more. Um, So John Kirby, the White House National Security Council spokesman, he was asked if there was any sort of slowdown. uh, And his response was, quote, I'm not going to get into the timeline for every individual system that's being provided. We continue to support Israel with their self-defense needs. That's not going to change. And we have been very, very direct about that, end quote. So he said it's not going to change that this fact that they're arming Israel, even as they're slaughtering Uh, all these civilians so when it comes to the we do know that the u.s is planning to give israel more military aid that's not really news i mean the the point here is that the the leveraging the conditioning that they're considering is completely completely ridiculous so we know that the u.s gives israel 3.8 billion dollars each year in military aid and since October 7th, the Biden administration has approved over 100 arms deals for Israel, and they kept them small under the threshold needed to notify Congress so they could you know, basically do it in secret, um, except for two of the arms sales, and those ones they just bypassed Congress to get them to Israel as fast as they could. Uh, and the U.S. is looking to give Israel another $14 billion. That's included in that big $95 billion foreign military aid bill that's passed the Senate, but it still hasn't been brought to a vote in the House. Gaza's health ministry put out an update on Sunday on the death toll. They said 31,645 Palestinians have been killed so far, and they've said consistently about two-thirds to 70% are women and children, and that is considered a low estimate as many are missing and presumed to be dead under the rubble. All right, so the next one here, Israel-Hamas hostage deal talks expected to resume in Qatar. So Qatari and Egyptian-mediated hostage deal talks between Israel and Hamas are expected to resume in Doha after a long pause in negotiations. Israeli media reported that the Israeli security cabinet approved sending a delegation led by Mossad chief David Barnea to Doha on Monday. Barnea received a general mandate to negotiate, 
But some decisions will have to be approved by Netanyahu and the Israeli defense minister. So Netanyahu has previously rejected an outline for a hostage deal that was actually drawn up by Barnia, uh, by the Mossad, and other top Israeli intelligence and military officials. He called Hamas's latest proposal ridiculous, but he said he planned to send a negotiating team to Doha anyway. And these are indirect negotiations. It's not like the Israelis and the Hamas guys are going to be sitting face to face. It's through mediation. So according to Haaretz, and I, I saw a few reports that basically said the same thing, Hamas's latest proposal dropped the demand for a permanent ceasefire to be agreed upon right away. Um, it, it would allow an initial exchange of Israeli hostages and Palestinian prisoners, and negotiations on a permanent truce would begin in the third phase of this deal that Hamas has proposed. Netanyahu called it ridiculous, but they're going to be negotiating it uh, anyway, or at least you know he's doing this um, to... Who knows exactly what Netanyahu's intentions are here? He might just be sending these negotiators to keep the to placate the U.S. Um, so publicly, Hamas officials are still saying that they want a permanent end to the Israeli onslaught, that they want a permanent ceasefire. Ahmad Abdul Hadi, who is Hamas's representative in Lebanon, told Al Mayadeen that Hamas had four conditions for a deal: a permanent ceasefire complete Israeli withdrawal from Gaza, an end to the siege, and the return of displaced Palestinians to their homes. So Netanyahu has made clear that he has no intention to end the slaughter in Gaza and that any truce as a result of a hostage deal would only be temporary. He continues to vow that Israel will eradicate Hamas, even though both U.S. and Israeli intelligence have said that that's not a realistic goal. And he said, Rafa invasion is going to happen. If, if there's a deal, we're still going to invade Rafa afterwards. Uh, so the next one here, Netanyahu approves plans for a Rafa ground invasion. So this article is from Kyle Anzalone. He wrote this up on Friday. And it says that Netanyahu approved a ground assault on Rafa, where there are at least 1.5 million Palestinians packed into this border city. And, and most are... You know, the, the vast majority, the pre-war population of the city was 275,000. So, you know, over 1.2 million are displaced. And his office said that Netanyahu approved the plans for action in Rafa, saying that the military is prepared for the operational side and for the evacuation of the population. The statement didn't provide details or timeline for the attack or for when it's going to happen. So that's not really clear. And they're saying that they're going to evacuate all these civilians somewhere, what they call, to what they call humanitarian islands, uh, whatever that means. And and we know the real goal is to, they really want to push them out into Egypt. Um, and Egypt is preparing to, for some of them to to cross the border, uh, but they they really don't want that to happen in Egypt. Um, so. You know, who knows what would happen if Israel launches this full invasion. And again, it's not clear when this might happen, but he has approved these plans. All right, so the next one here, UNICEF says that Israel has killed over 13,000 children in Gaza. So the UN's Child Relief Agency said on Sunday that over 13,000 children have been killed in the Gaza Strip and that many more could be dead under the rubble. So this is UNICEF's executive director, Catherine Russell. She said, quote, thousands more have been injured or we can't determine where they are. They may be stuck under rubble. We haven't seen that rate of death among children in almost any other conflict in the world, end quote. So Gaza's health ministry, I just mentioned the, the numbers that I said before, over 31,000 killed. Um, so when it comes to the death toll, again, uh, the many are missing. So we assume that the, this is a low count that we're getting from Gaza's health ministry. If you remember a few weeks ago, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said he was asked how many Palestinian women and children have been killed. He said over 25,000. And then the Pentagon walked that back and claimed that he was talking about all Palestinians who were killed. But he was asked explicitly about women and children. And I'm sure that the Pentagon has its own independent assessment Um so there might be some truth in that number that he said. But either way, it's a horrific toll. 
and UNICEF is saying it's over 13,000. And Russell, the UNICEF director, said that she visited a hospital ward where children were suffering from severe malnutrition and said that the place was quiet because the children and, and the babies don't have the energy to cry. And, and this is how horrific the situation is when it comes to the malnutrition and starvation uh, for these, these kids in Gaza. And separately, the UN's Palestinian Relief Agency, UNRWA, said that one in three children under the age of two in Gaza is now acutely malnourished. One out of three children under the age of two acutely malnourished. And despite this horrific situation and Israel's continued restrictions on aid, the U.S. is still providing unconditional military aid although they might add some conditions and say, hey, uh, this is, here's some ways you can get more military aid, apparently. Um, so the U.S. continues to support this starvation campaign. Uh, the next one here, a U.S. senator says that Israel's claims about UNRWA's ties to Hamas are flat-out lies. So this article is from Kyle, and it says a Democratic senator blasted Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other leaders in Israel for making false accusations about aid agencies operating in Gaza, Israel has claimed that the UN Aid Agency for Palestinians, UNRWA, was acting as a proxy of Hamas. Senator Chris Van Hollen said, quote, There's no doubt that the claim that Netanyahu and others are making that somehow UNRWA is a proxy for Hamas are just flat-out lies. That's a flat-out lie if you look at the person who's in charge of operations on the ground in Gaza for UNRWA. It's about a 20-year U.S. Army veteran. You can be sure he is not in cahoots with Hamas. Netanyahu has wanted to get rid of UNRWA since at least 2017, end quote. And so Van Hollen, you know, he said this stuff. Uh, he's actually called the Israelis war criminals, which what does that mean? The U.S. is for giving them military aid. But on this big speech he gave on the Senate floor, he said the Israelis were war criminals, but then he went ahead and voted to send more aid to Israel because his justification was, oh, it's rolled in with Ukraine aid. We have to get that over there. So he voted for the aid anyway, even though he's saying things like this. All right, so the next one here, Israeli airstrikes destroy a house in Lebanon. So this article is from Jason Ditz. Israeli airstrikes against southern Lebanon continued on Sunday with the strike targeting a house in Aitarun, uh for the second day in a row. So Saturday's strike set the house on fire, and then Sunday's strike appears to have finished destroying it. Israeli planes also attacked Marwahin and Aita Ashab, and an Israeli drone strike was also reported in Aita Ashab. So this is these are other locations in southern Lebanon. No word yet on casualties or damage in these other strikes. So near daily strikes have been reported by both sides for months. And Hezbollah reported it has carried out rocket attacks against Israeli troops near near the Israeli, sorry, near the Lebanese village of Wazani. Israel has yet to comment on the matter. So these uh, strikes across the border continue. No sign yet of any sort of deal to de-escalate tensions. Hezbollah has said if there's a ceasefire in Gaza, they'll stop. Israel has threatened to actually escalate if there's a ceasefire, escalate in the north if there's a ceasefire in Gaza. All right, so the next one here, Israeli airstrikes hit southern Syria, one soldier injured. So Syrian media reported Israeli airstrikes in southern Syria on early Sunday morning. A military source told Syria's Sanaa Sana news agency that uh, the target they hit targets outside of Damascus in the countryside. Uh, only one soldier was reported wounded, and there was some material damage. And Israel has really escalated its airstrikes in Syria since October 7th. I know uh, Israel frequently bombed Syria before then. And I know up to that point uh, in 2023, Israel bombed Syria about 25 times by my count, just covering the airstrikes for antiwar.com. And since October 7th, they've really ramped things up. Um, and some of these strikes have killed Iranians, members of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which, of course really risks um, provoking Iran, of course, uh, some sort of big response from Iran. And uh, the defense ministers of Iran and Syria, they held a meeting on Saturday and they discussed the Israeli airstrikes in Syria as well as 
the U.S. recent U.S. airstrikes in Syria and the and in general the U.S. occupation of eastern Syria, which is opposed by the government in Damascus, of course, um, and of course also opposed by Iran. All right, so the next one here, the U.K. tells Ukraine to focus on targeting Crimea. So British military officials advise that Ukraine should focus on defense in its ground fight against Russia in the east while focusing on targeted strikes against Crimea and Russia's Black Sea fleet. And this was reported by the Sunday Times. And this advice was given when British Defense Secretary Grant Shapps and UK Army Chief Anthony Anthony Radikin visited Ukraine last week. The British officials said that rather than attacking, Ukrainian forces should hold the line and pull back to more favorable ground if necessary, and that they're talking about the the battlefield uh, in eastern and southern Ukraine. Uh, but they're saying that this will allow Ukrainian forces to focus their efforts on the Black Sea and Crimea, where their forces, uh, with the help of Western long-range missiles, have hit uh, targets over the past six months. So this is really incredibly provocative to, to, to think about. You have these high-level British officials going over there and telling Ukraine, you know those missiles we gave you? Keep hitting Crimea and Russia's Black Sea fleet with them. Um, and attacks on Crimea have always been considered a red line for Putin, but that hasn't stopped Ukraine's Western backers from facilitating and supporting them. And this came, this visit came after that recording of German military officers talking that was published by Russian media revealed that British troops in Ukraine, on the ground in Ukraine, are helping them fire the Storm Shadow missiles, which have a range of 155 miles. I was looking just through uh, TASS media reports. Um, TASS is a, one of the Russian uh, media state media outlets. Just searching, you know, Storm Shadows, Shadows and Crimea, and there is multiple reports of Ukraine using them in attacks on Crimea. Uh, and the UK has also helped Ukraine strike Russian ships in the Black Sea. There was another recent report from the Times that credit, credited Rodikin, who again is the head of the British uh, Army. They credited him with the Ukrainians' strategy uh, to destroy Russian ships, with, with basically helping create that strategy to destroy Russian ships. And Ukrainian attacks on Crimea and territory inside the Russian mainland have increased a lot over the past few months. As it's been clear, Ukraine cannot win on the battlefield. Since Russia captured the strategic Donetsk city of Avdivka last month, Russian forces have been making steady gains in the east, and Ukraine is suffering from serious manpower and weapon shortages. But they want to use these longer-range uh, missiles that they have from NATO. All right, so the next one here, Ukraine launches dozens of drone attacks across western Russia. So Ukraine launched dozens of drones across Russia over the weekend, attacks that coincided with Russian elections that saw Putin win another term, according to the preliminary results as of Sunday night. So the Russian Defense Ministry said that its forces shot down 35 Ukrainian drones across eight Russian oblasts on Sunday morning. According to South Front, Russian forces downed a total of 54 drones on Saturday and Sunday. The Russian Defense Ministry said that 17 drones were downed in Russia's southern Krasnodar Oblast on Sunday, and four were intercepted in the Moscow region. Local authorities said that one person died of a heart attack during an attack on an oil refinery in Krasnodar, but no other casualties were reported. And South Front, South Front put out this map of the locations of all of these drone attacks pretty spread out across western russia this is a pretty major attack um and i know again the, the frequency and kind of the the number of drones that ukraine has been sending into russia has really increased but this this is one of the biggest attacks you know in a single day or or in two days that that i remember seeing and South Front said that a total of 19 drones targeted the border region of Belgorod throughout the weekend. And last week, for a few days, uh, militias fighting for Ukraine, made up of Russian volunteers, attempted a ground incursion into Belgorod and into the Kursk Oblast, another border region. 
and they use tanks and U.S. armored vehicles. So this includes so the uh, Russian Volunteer Corps, which is a neo-Nazi militia. The leader of the Russian Volunteer Corps is a very well-known neo-Nazi, and he's he was born in Russia. Um, he's lived in Europe. I think he's he might have grown up in Germany or something, but he he uh, openly neo-Nazi, and and so are other members of this this militia. And they've attacked this Belgorod region before with U.S. armored vehicles. They say that they're armed with American military equipment. Gangs of neo-Nazis attacking Russian territory with U.S. military equipment. I mean, it's completely insane that this is where we're at, um, that this isn't even big news anymore. Um, so when it comes to this attack, this so now th this is a ground attack into Russia by these militias. Russia is saying that they killed a bunch of them. They said that they killed a total of 550 fighters and that they thwarted the attack while the Russian Volunteer Corps has claimed fighting is ongoing. They're still saying, they said on Saturday that there's still fighting going on. Um, so all of this really just, you know, the risk of a huge escalation is always still there. Russia views all these drone attacks, all these attacks on their territory as being facilitated, supported by the West. And you know, they're, they're right. Um, there was a report in The Economist last year that said Ukrainian drone attacks on Russia use Western-provided uh, intelligence. So there's all sorts of uh, uh, evidence. And, of course, the CIA support for Ukrainian intelligence that's carried out assassinations inside Russia, all sorts of evidence for the uh, killing, for, for the U.S. And, and NATO involvement in these operations inside Russia. All right, so the next one here, Niger says that the U.S. military presence is no longer justified. So Niger announced on Saturday that it was suspending military cooperation with the U.S. and that the U.S. presence in the country was no longer justified, singling that the U.S. will have to withdraw its troops from Niger. So Colonel Major Amadou Abda Ramain, who's a spokesman for the military-led government, made the announcement after a U.S. delegation visited Niger. He said that the U.S. officials did not show respect for Niger's sovereignty. Uh, he said, quote, Niger reg regrets the intention of the American delegation to deny the sovereign Nigerian people the right to choose their partners and types of partnerships capable of truly helping them fight against terrorism, end quote. So this is a big deal because the U.S. has a big drone base in Niger known as Air Base 201, which costs over $100 million to build, and it's used as a hub for U.S. operations in West Africa. And before Mohamed Bazoum was taken out of power last July, the U.S. had about 1,100 troops in Niger. As of December, the U.S. had 648 troops stationed in the country. So the U.S. formally declared that the ouster of Bazoum was a coup, which requires the suspension of U.S. military aid. But the U.S. was looking for ways to cooperate with the junta to maintain its military presence. However, there are signs that the U.S. was also preparing for the possibility of getting kicked out. There was a report from the Wall Street Journal earlier this year that said the U.S., is in talks with other West African states to base drones on their territory, including Benin, the Ivory Coast, and Ghana. So they, 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 they're they not going to say, okay, that's it. Let's uh, pack our bags and go home, give up this whole war on terror in the Sahel. It's been a total disaster. I know according to Nick Terse's reporting, terrorism has increased like 100,000% or, or something since the U.S. got involved in 2002 and 2003. Uh, in this war on terror in Africa. I mean, it's just been a complete disaster, a uh, complete failure. Uh, but Niger's post-coup government, known as the National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland, they expelled France uh, pretty quickly. France completed its withdrawal in December. So now they made this announcement. They didn't explicitly say that the U.S. has to leave, but I'm sure that, that that's going to be the result. So some good news on this front here is that ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States that was threatening military intervention to reinstate Bazoom, they actually recently, I missed this, last month, they lifted sanctions that they put on Niger after the coup. And those sanctions were really harsh from how I understood it. It was really hurting people in Niger. But those sanctions are lifted. So I guess ECOWAS 
is accepting that they're not going to be able to change uh, what's happening in Niger. But we'll see. Hopefully this leads to a U.S. withdrawal. Uh, unfortunately, um, that means they're probably going to expand somewhere else. We'll never get uh, quite what we want, but uh, an end to the U.S. presence in Niger uh, could definitely be a good thing. All right, so the last story here, TikTok threat is purely hypothetical, U.S. intelligence admits. So this article is from Ken Klippenstein at The Intercept. And essentially what it what he does here is he goes through the comments from U.S. intelligence officials and, and intelligence agencies about TikTok, this allegation that China has used all of this, uh, has used TikTok to spy on Americans or collect their data. There's no evidence of that. Uh, they've never even said that there was when it comes to the intelligence agencies. Of course, in Congress, you get all this hysteria and hyperbole from from members of Congress and China Hawks in the media and, and elsewhere. Um, uh, but he just looks at some quotes from uh, the FBI director, Christopher Wray. He goes through and the, the allegation is that because ByteDance is a Chinese company, which is the parent company of TikTok, that means they're totally controlled. But there's no evidence of them coordinating with the Chinese government. And Ray, he, again, he just goes through Ray's comments and other U.S. intelligence officials. And he says, oh, they have the ability to collect data if they if they want to. They have the potential. They could potentially do this, potentially do that. Um, and But it, it, it means that there's no evidence. And then the Intercept asked if the FBI has any new evidence uh, about TikTok coordinating with the Chinese government. They just referred to raise prior statements so they have no evidence and this is something that came out i remember when trump was trying to get bite dance to to sell the company the cia there's some assessment that said there's no evidence that they're directly doing it um so it's you know you watch these congressional hearings and we actually have a good viewpoint about it from michael tracy but the hysteria is just i mean it's complete insanity when, whenever they're talking about china but especially uh, with TikTok, it's just like, it's just so ridiculous. Um, but that is it for the news for today. Go check out our viewpoints. We have one from Jonathan Cook. Torture, ex executions, babies left to die, sexual abuse. These are Israel's crimes. One from Stephen Semler. Joe Biden is shipping weapons to Israel every 36 hours. One from Andy Corbley. In Navalny and Guaido, the U.S. saw useful pawns, not political paragons. One from Brandon Buck, fact check, debating NATO was never out of bounds. And the uh, spotlights from Michael Tracy at his Substack. The frenzy to ban TikTok is another national security state scam. And I think that is very clear. Uh, so that is everything for today. I hope everyone had a good weekend. Um, I know uh, one thing that's happening this week is Idaho has a House committee that's going to be taking up the Defend the Guard Act. In the story I wrote last week, they said that they're expecting a hearing on Friday. I know now that the hearing is scheduled for Monday. They might, they're trying to finagle, do some tricky things with scheduling and possibly delay it. So we might have some news on that tomorrow. Uh, but Defend the Guard, go check it out, defendtheguard.us. If you want a phone bank for them, I've been putting the link in the description of every show. Um, go check out our Instagram, Twitter. We should probably make a TikTok now, right? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I'll be back tomorrow with some more news for you. Thanks for listening.